Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our February 8th evening, um, our board meeting. We do have translation in Spanish, so if you need that support, please see Urania Lopez. So, tenemos traducción en español. Si necesita de este servicio, por favor, pase con Urania Lopez. If uh, someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, please complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria prior to the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes. Um, so today, so we'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. And today, um, I will ask uh, Trustee Soto to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, and move on to item 3.3, .3, our superintendent comments. Yes, thank you very much. So as you all know, we um, do the Youth Truth Survey every year. Um, it allows us to get really great responses from our students, our families, and our staff. Um, each year, what we do is we create a, what we call a one-sheeter, which is an infographic, which really provides a glimpse of some of the successes and um, also some of the things that we're hearing from the survey and then our response. So something that's been really important for us is each time we ask for a survey, we want to do actions off of that survey and not just have it be that way. So you'll see that this year we had 14,100 responses. Um, we did see um, a decrease, um, mostly in our family. So we did see a 6% decrease um, from the 2021 school year. Um, students remain fairly stable with 2% um, less and then staff um, was only 1% less. When you look at the successes, if you could just scroll down a little bit, the successes you'll see at elementary, you'll see where we are and then you'll see where the California average is. So for elementary, some of our strong points is um, academic challenge and culture. Um, down below, which I won't read, but is, um, were, is comments from our students. Um, in middle school, they're, um, we're at the 91st percentile for um, emotional and mental health. Um, and so really want to thank all of our uh, mental health clinicians, our social emotional counselors, school psychologists out there that are helping our students because they're noting um, that support. Um, engagement um, was another high area for us. Again, for high school, social emotional support um, was high up there. And then also college and career readiness. So all the support of the counselors, the academic counselors, and then also our um, access um, staff through UCSC. Um, if you could scroll down to where it says vulnerable student population. So something that was unique about us was that our vulnerable students actually had much higher um, survey results than um, national. So our English learners actually had a higher rate than our non-English learners in almost in four out of the five survey themes, so on most of them. Our students with IEPs um, had a slightly higher rate than their peers as well. And then LGBTQ students that usually have a significant dip um, here in our school district actually have very similar ratings. Um, and so um, you'll see in the areas of engagement, culture, and relationships, it's actually very similar. So we do have some opportunities and challenges that we're wanting to address. Um, so one of them is in the area of relationships. What you'll see is um, the families and staff, it's fairly high and consistent, um, and it's not as much with the positive um, when it comes to students. Um, and so when you keep scrolling down to the dark blue, you'll see here are some of the things that we're going to continue to do, some of the programs that we're continue, going to continue to implement um, to help support that. And then the last piece um, to really highlight it, which is an area of opportunity, is safety. And so you'll see that there was a decrease. So because we've done so much on safety, what we did this time is we actually have a QR code. So if you scan that QR code, 
then and if you go to the other document, um, then what will be brought up is this document right here. Um, and you'll basically see the key areas that we focused on, um, which includes additional staffing and supervision, um, updated security camera technology, um, improved communication systems. So it talks about the Stop It app and Rave, um, and then also the new additional parameter fencing. And so this will be released in my weekly um, my weekly message to staff on Friday, and then Alicia soon after will be releasing it to the community. So you guys got a first stop of looking at it. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. So we'll move on to item 3.4, our governing board comments and our report on standing committees. And so this is where each of our board members uh, can make a few comments. So um, let's see, we'll start on our other side here. So um, Trustee Flores. Hello everyone, thank you for being here tonight. Um, this week, these last two weeks, I was able to attend a community advisory meeting and get some more information on um, SELPA, Heather did a great presentation. It was very informative for me. I look forward to more meetings um, with them. And I also was able to do a um, site visit at um, H.A. Hyde, which was really great. I was able to go into several classrooms there and I was able to also see um, some of the uh, different classes that they offer there. Um, they have a lot of options there at, at that elementary. So it was really good and I look forward to visiting more campuses. And Vice President Acosta. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, just to report out, um, we were going to be having a CTE um, advisory committee meeting, um, I believe, tomorrow, but that's going to have to be postponed until next month. So we'll be looking forward to reporting back out on that next month. Um, we did have our committee meeting on um, Monday looking at the um, pool of candidates who have applied um, for the vacant trustee area seat um, since Trustee Orozco is now um, Councilwoman Orozco. And um, I'm going to leave that for President Holmes. She's going to have a report and discussion item on that, but we will be having that meeting on um, Saturday and that agenda is posted. So I highly encourage you if you um, want your voice to be heard on that to show up on Saturday and let us hear your voice on that. Other than that, ha thank you for coming tonight and I hope everybody has, uh, if I don't see you before, hope you have enjoyed the two long holiday weekends coming up. But make sure your kids are back in school on Tuesday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Our student trustee, Morial. Hi, good evening everyone. Um, so I actually just got back from Watsonville High. We were having our freshman orientation. It's when um, incoming freshmen come in with their parents and just learn about campus. And there's a lot of um, exciting things going on. And um, also last week I attended the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. It was an annual celebration and it focused on like achievement and resilience. And we just looked back on this past year and everything that we've done. Um, also, um, at school, I've just been trying to get through the last semester. It's been going by really fast, but um, it's the last stretch for us, so got this. Also, um, <laughs> I've been busy filling out like scholarship applications, and I know a lot of seniors are also doing that, so um, good luck to everyone. And um, we're just w like playing the waiting game now for all our <laughs> college apps, which is kind of scary. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you. Trustee DeSerpa. <laughs> Didn't she do a great job? She's pretty amazing. She's got a big interview coming up this week, so I'm not going to say where, but it's a big one. <laughs> Super exciting. Um, so this week I attended a forum um, for new, uh, new Leader Academy, um, uh, moderated by Dr. Ferris Sabah from our COE, and I was a panelist with, an, with other board members from across the county to talk about the role of a board member and how we work directly with administration to improve things for students and families. So that was really an honor. And um, welcome tonight to the board meeting. Trustee Soto. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here and joining us this evening. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the selection process to fill the vacant seat on our board. And uh, I'm excited to see that we have you know a few or, co or four candidates that have some potential. So uh, thanks, and we'll see you Saturday. 
All right. So I attended um, our SELPA's Community Advisory uh, Committee and um, great presentation by uh, ben Slider, our student services coordinator, gave a comprehensive overview of the um, IEP, you know, 504 process and the district's, you know, multi-tiered system of support. Um, and you know, Heather Gorman, our director, our SELPA director, great, great presentations for our, our SELPA families. Also attended today's uh, benefits committee, discussed open enrollment, um, issues with educating, you know, members about the options and just the challenges of trying to figure out the differences between HMOs and PPOs and what all the different, you know, you know, things like mean on what, how to choose your best plan and the ongoing challenges of in-network and out-of-network providers and knowing where, you know, how to get the best plan that suits uh, members' needs. Um, I also attended our, uh, our selection committee meeting and I'll talk about that at the agenda item though, where we discuss our meeting on the 11th, uh, update for that. All right, so um, item 3.5, our high school students board representatives report. Um, we have some students from uh, Pajaro Valley High School. Go ahead and come on up. Good evening, everyone. My name is Estefania Garcia, and I'll be reporting for PV High today. So to kick off the month of November, we began by taking our students to a leadership conference in Salinas. There we participated in multiple activities to learn more about how to become better leaders with other students from Salinas and Santa Cruz County. We made sure to show grizzly pride and have fun with our fellow grizzlies. Following the conference, we had our second club carnival of the year, in which our students decided on the food they wanted to sell in order to raise money for their clubs. Our senior class decided to sell baked potatoes as a fundraiser for their senior trip to Disneyland. They sold $15 tickets for baked potatoes and raised around $1,000. Next, leadership hosted a food drive from November 28th to December 2nd, in which we collected canned and packaged foods. We paired up with the Second Harvest Food Bank and collected our donations in four separate bins for all different grade levels. We didn't collect as many donations as we would have liked to, but we are looking for new ways to improve it in the next year's food drive. For our Winter Spirit Week, we had noontime activities such as arts and crafts, holiday trivia, and a gift wrapping competition. As for the spirit attire, we had pajama day on Monday, Disney gear or dress as your favorite Disney character on Tuesday, warm attire on Wednesday, holiday accessories on Thursday, and cute, ugly, or DIY sweater day on Friday. That same week, our PVHS band held a winter concert in the Mellow Center, which was free. To welcome our students back from a long and relaxing winter break, we had a new year, new me spirit week in which included many new and different spirit days that we had never done before. We had kids backpack day on Monday, white lies on Tuesday, dress as your favorite teacher on Wednesday, there at 10, but on Thursday, and minion day on Friday. Our grizzlies had a lot of fun and we definitely saw many new and interesting phrases on their 10, but day, as well as on the white lies day. My personal favorite was definitely minions day, since seniors got to dress up in their purple rally shirts meaning that I saw a lot of goofy purple minions. For the month of February, our most important event would definitely be the celebration of Black History Month, for which we are highlighting 28 black icons for 28 days on our Instagram page and in our tutorial classes. We would also like to, <laughs> we would also like to recognize Lauren Burke and Damien for having amazing spirit so we give them the spirit chain right there. That's it, thank you for listening, goodbye. Thank you. And do we have um, students from Renaissance High School?
Good evening, board presidents. I am Brandon Arredondo Marquez. Uh, good evening, I'm Juan Mora, student leadership representative. And we're both for Renaissance High School. As part of our maintaining a positive campus culture, we closed out the fall semester with activity day, wherein during the last period of the last day of the semester, students got to participate in their desired activities. Here we see students thoroughly engaged in activities of dodgeball, volleyball, and golf. These sorts of events really helped build relationships between students and staff and are simply great fun. The addition of golf was made possible by teachers lending out their personal golf clubs. This new addition has been empowering for our students who otherwise felt as though wired society was excluding people like them from the otherwise privileged world of golf. Students also got to do indoor activities like creating art or producing varied crafts. Yeah. Students also got the opportunity to work on their schoolwork or work on arranging concurrent enrollments at Cabrillo. You can do sports. The Renaissance is proud to say that after two year hiatus, basketball has returned to rolling, uh, Renaissance High School. Currently, the team is 0 and 1 after a very close game with Costa Noa. The Dragons are looking forward to playing new school on Friday. Seeing maintenance crews work at work, there is hope for similar return of soccer later this year. One teacher reported the field as a little lumpy, but usable for practice at least. I'm told that rodents have compromised the field before and this has student leadership wondering if perhaps a turf field would be more sustainable. If we had a turf field, perhaps Renaissance student leadership could raise funds by manage, uh, managing the rental of such a field to outside groups. A turf field would also assuage the concerns of Soquel Creek Water District board members who are reluctant to link up with Renaissance out of concern about high water demand due to our grass field. Students of the month, congratulations to our Wattsville Rotary students of the month, Edwin and Christina. Academics. Thanks to the flexibility and merit across Metacracity of Renaissance High Variety Credit System, we have had 12 students graduate this introductional year and three students get approved to matriculate. Never stay there. We wish all of the former we wish all of our former dragons the best as they take on a new challenges outside of Renaissance. Oh, not there yet. One of our students was able to arrange a partnership with Vitana Wildlife Society to support our biology program, currently a vacant position, filled by a long-term sub. This partnership will help support our PBIS program and provide students the opportunity to see how concepts from the classroom apply and manifest in real life. Thankfully, this partnership does not create new financial burdens to RHS or the district and offers teachers paid professional development time as classroom instruction is refined to support the outdoor education program. Students are hopeful that field trips within the outdoor education program will be approved. Some of the field trips destinations include a visit to Ellicott Slot National Wildlife Refuge, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, Kayaking at Moss Landing, just a name to few within the 12 week program. Conclusion, a special thanks to the PVUSD counselors for all of their efforts. Thanks to classified staffs for all your hard work. We hope you get the salary increase that you deserve. Thank you for this opportunity to present.
Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, student presenters. Um, moving on to item 4.1, approval of our agenda. I would like to move to approve our agenda, but I'd like to move um, item 9.1 before item 8.1. We have several students who are going to be presenting on that agenda item. That's our um, seal, uh, basically on the California State Seal of Civic Engagement. Um, so do I have a second for that? A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, 501. Um, item 5.1, approval of the January 25th, 2023 board meeting minutes. Uh, can I have a motion? I move to approve. A second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, 501. All right, we'll move on to item 6.1, our public comment. This is the opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for the evening. So just as a reminder, although um, the Brown Act prohibits us from engaging in back and forth discussion about these items, we are listening and are interested in what you have to say. So do we have any public comments? Yes, we do, President Holm. Uh, we have one. Six. We All have right. six public speakers on 6.1. Great. And I'll call out three names at a time. If you could come up to the podium and um, line up, uh, it would be wonderful. And if I mispronounce your name, please do correct me. Uh, Tracy Weiss, Sarah Baumgart, Baumgart, and Sherry Osterlin. Perfect. Thank you. Did I get them all good? Yeah. Good. There we go, now can you hear me? Wonderful, thank you so much. Superintendent Rodriguez, trustees, thank you so much for letting me take a moment this evening. My name is Tracy Weiss. I'm the executive director with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey. I've had the pleasure of serving with that organization for about the last 10 months. And I wanted to take a moment this evening to first introduce myself. The Sea Odyssey has had the pleasure of serving this community for over 20 years. And year over year, we have welcomed the students from PVUSD. Um, and we are thrilled to be able to continue to do that going forward. Um, just for those that are not familiar with the O'Neill Sea Odyssey, we serve upper elementary age students with the opportunity to engage hands-on STEM-based learning out on the water on our living classroom, a 65-foot catamaran that allows students to explore the studies of marine biology, navigation, science, all while getting to learn about our bay while out on the bay. Um, we are a 100% free program, and we are working to eliminate any barrier that is preventing students from participating in our experience this year. Now, we have 13 classes scheduled to join us this spring, and unfortunately, with some of the changes in scheduling that has been coming down the line, there is a risk of us not being able to serve those students. So I wanted to just take a moment and bring that to the awareness of this group. Um, transportation challenges have been well documented and we know that it is a challenge to get buses at this point and to find the necessary drivers to staff everything as it would be. But right now we are not able to get the classes there in the window of time that has been allotted for a bus. And so we are trying to work with the necessary departments this year and to find solutions. But we're hoping that we can put this on your radar and to request a future agenda item for you to consider expanding the window of transportation that will be available for students and classes to be able to access field-based programs such as this. This is a critical experience for students to be able to see themselves as scientists in the future, and we really appreciate all you do. So thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Baumgart. I am one of your teachers. This is my 
oh my goodness, 18th year here at Pajaro Valley Unified School District, uh, many at Watsonville High, and now I'm a Panther at Pajaro Middle School. And I'm here to talk with you about our, our motto, you know, together we lift up to build for the future. And my father was a builder. I was raised in a building family. And I learned that you always have to have a strong foundation. You can't build a solid anything if you don't start with a strong foundation. So I'm really here to ask you to build the foundation in our district for all our students by raising the salary of our early childhood educators. And I'm also asking you to put a solid roof on our district by raising our adult education salary. We need the bottom, we need the top. Together we can lift up and provide quality education for all students. Thank you. Good? Yeah. Okay. My name is Sherry Osterlin, and um, I am also one of your uh, PBUSD teachers. I work with Sarah now at Pajaro Middle School. And this is my 31st year of teaching overall. And so I'm also going to be speaking about uh, the early childhood educators because I don't think I really understood it like most of the time with teaching. I mean, you kind of always just think about your people, your teachers. But Sarah and I were having dinner and we were actually talking about our children. Her child is a doctor and mine is a lawyer. And they would not be where they are if not for that love of learning that they have. I mean, really. And I was a very, I was a very young mother. So when I looked around for early childhood educators, or basically called a babysitter back then, uh, so that I could go to work, I actually wanted a place that was going to teach him things since I was incredibly young. And um, I was lucky, and I found a wonderful place that did. And when he started kindergarten, he was reading, he was writing, and he, like I said, is now a lawyer with the Air Force and the Internal Revenue Service. So I think I did pretty well in that. But I don't think our families have the opportunities. They have to take what we give them, what our district gives them. And I want you to know that we are challenged as teachers. I'm a middle school teacher, we're challenged. And these, they need that foundation. And I know it's an entry level position, and I know that's what people think, but if we don't give them a path, these teachers, to maybe become either, maybe they don't want to become teachers, maybe they want to be an early educator, you know, they want to be in teaching those kids. I guess I think everybody wants what I want, higher kids. But I just want you to know that we need them. We need them. Thank you. And you need to think about that. So our next three are um, Jose Manuel Serrano Hernandez, Donna Lefevre, and Chris Swim. Um, buenas noches. Uh, uh, buenas noches. My, my name is Manuel Serrano. I am a teacher of the um, uh, uh, the Watsonville Children's Center, and I have right now 44 students, and something is changing, I don't know what it is, but now I need to beg my administrators to let me go and be participating in IEPs, and also I feel the, I do a lot in my classroom, I really help them to include all these uh, special ed students, and every day I have 44 students, and I try to figure out how to support them, how to help them. And if I see the resources the Pajaro Valley Unified School District are putting there for the teachers, and if the teachers will not have the access, I go to my coordinators or my director or the principal, vice principal, to ask them to have this access and not, not to feel them treated differently. But I'm here because I feel that now the district is treating the whole department different. All my coworkers are different. Like when you are offering only eight percent increase in salary to the early childhood educators, but you are offering more to the they deserve more. I think 
TK12, they deserve 13, 15% more. Uh, but we feel, many of my coworkers are start talking about that they feel discriminated. And, and I'm here to ask you, please consider that we are teachers, we go to the university, in my case, we went on many of my coworkers, and many of my coworkers are the good examples of parents of who they went to, they were working in the fields, and they went to school, they went to Cabrillo, and the uh, California teacher credential, they're the ones who give us the permits, and we need to do professional development, and we need to do all this stuff that we do as a teachers. And every day I teach my students, I try to, uh, to make them feel so incredible, powerful, and I'm so happy they had a parent sitting in the board. I didn't know that. <laughs> you are there? Okay, it's incredible. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Donna Lefever. <clears throat> I'm a math teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, so yeah, we need to be making sure that we are respecting all of our professionals and um, paying a respectable wage to people that are teaching our kids is, I think, very reasonable to ask. So let's be respectful to all of our employees. Um, I also want to speak a little bit for uh, the teachers, specifically at Watsonville High School. Man, it's been a long time. Our, all of our meetings have been around adjusting to this uh, vote of our schedule change. and. Um, then we got this email back, we're not gonna be able to vote on a seven period schedule, that's off the table. Um, and the, one of the reasons was like, it wasn't clear why we wanted to make that change. So I wanna talk about the people who are advocating for the seven period schedule the most at, at our school site was um, the special ed department and um, our ag department, really strong, but a lot of the elective teachers. And it's because um, if the kids want to get, take advantage of their support class if they have an IEP, then that takes off a place where they could have an elective class because they're trying to go A through G, they're trying to make it to college, and so they need to make sure that all of their academic classes are filled. With a six period class, some of our students lose access to these um, elective opportunities. Um, our ag department, and as well as many of the um, extracurricular, or not extracurricular, all of the elective courses that are available at Watsonville High School are incredible, taught by incredible individuals. Um, I want kids to be able to take advantage of those. If kids are in a, have a class that's taken for credit recovery, they lose an option to take that elective. Um, it limits their opportunity to explore the arts. We have a band now, and there's a class for band, and that's amazing, but my sister had to choose between what elective she took. She couldn't take as many art classes because she was a, in a band student. You know, Having this wider schedule, because these A through G requirements are become so high, we wanna make sure we had this wider schedule. And the only reason that it's not being looked at is because we don't have enough teachers, and it's because we don't respect that position right now. We don't have enough coming in. So we need to make sure we're thinking about the kids' education and getting staff to our school by paying them reasonable, respectable salaries. Um, hearing Dr. Rodriguez's comments on matriculation in December during the uh, Apex Learning Agenda item, it seemed to me that she and the academic counselors were not necessarily on the same page. And I also took uh, issue with the implication in her comments about Renaissance credits. Um, one thing that's been needed for years uh, from, from Renaissance teacher advisors is clear terms on matriculating back to each respective comprehensive high school. And that's not always been clear, and I feel like it's even more so this year. Um, I'll, as I watch different students matriculate and others get denied or delayed, the whole thing feels a little inequitable to me and, and lacking due process. Um, before the start of every semester, the respective terms for matriculation should be clearly communicated in writing to the teacher advisors of Renaissance, secondary principals, and academic counselors, and to any prospective Renaissance student. They should know what they need to do in order to succeed. Um, another thing, Renaissance veterans, we, we know that it, when there's storms, it's there's, the roads to Renaissance can easily be rendered impassable. And early communication is critical. And, and our new admin learned this kind of the hard way in that first day of the semester. And, but being new, I give him a pass. But what I truly found commendable was thereafter, he went the extra mile to show up early, to uh, set up a communication routine 
that got the information that teachers needed in a timely manner so that we could make the appropriate decisions so we can get to school safely. Um, I'm hopeful that that responsive, logical, and caring leadership style trickles up. Um, another thing, uh, so some of the changes that have been put to Renaissance in the last year or two, I, I feel like haven't, they've gotten away from what is proven best, best practice. And to, as I hear about new changes um, putting down to us, uh, I f it's audacious to me because I, I look at like our attendance and our achievement and I'm just like, well, we went from model continuation was approved to, to not. How can like you, you guys broke something? Don't don't try and don't try and like redo it. Like let us get back to what works. So and, and the other thing with that is like with if MTSS was truly supporting the way it should, some of those um, issues should get picked up and, and they're not. They're not getting picked up the way our old program would. Thank you. All right, moving on to section seven. So we'll hear from our employee organizations. Um, each will have five minutes. So item 7.1, we'll hear from our Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Good evening. <clears throat> Okay, so I, first I wanna begin by thanking all of our education and support staff who connect, help connect students to our site um, mental health supports like our counselors, our school psychologists, and our mental health clinicians because that's the classroom and, and the playground is where it all begins. Um, while uh, cameras, uh, in regards to the, the survey that was displayed earlier, um, while cameras and fences provide a level of vigilance, the real importance of ensuring that our district um, sites are well, um, you know, if they're well staffed, we're going to then foster an environment of connections for our students and, and, and safety. So we need people. Um, so that then takes me to negotiations. Um, we are making some headway, and while um, we have done that, we have advocated for our ECE teachers to be valued because, as I shared the last meeting, they are a foundational um, building block for uh, our incoming primary um, students. So, as I shared last time, a beginning ECE teacher makes fifteen ninety eight an hour. They have to take college courses and be licensed through the state. You heard it from teacher Manuel. Um, and right now, uh, an IA actually would make more than an, a trained ECE teacher. Um, and that is a concern um, because it just speaks, I mean, just it just speaks to the value of, or non-value of our young students and our, and our, and our families um, in the educational system. So our ECE teachers establish foundational skills in socializing, community, community, literacy, routines, they change diapers, and they keep detailed records of each student's progress. They deserve a better salary. Our adult ed education teachers enrich, empower, and embolden our community. The ESL and citizenship teachers enrich our community through building language skills. Our CTE adult ed teachers establish skills that enrich the community, the, the county's workforce. And our fee payer courses also enrich and brighten our community members. All this translates to a larger workforce. While these two groups are funded differently, they are embedded into our school district and should, be, should not be undervalued. Those ECE students become our TK-12 students who then become our local college and university students. The adult ed students become high school graduates, citizens, English speakers, and our local workforce, as well as students um, in our college and, and universities, and many are also parents of our current students and future students. So all of the, this, this district is, is huge, and we impact everybody at so many levels. Um, and the attrition has been too great in the past few years, and we can't only rely on it's a teacher shortage as the excuse. We have issues in this district with management. People are not being treated respectfully. Teachers, what I'm seeing as and sitting in my position and what I get to see is I see people who are being non-reelected or not invited next year 
because they have stood up to advocate for themselves or for their students. And so that it's not based on their lack of ability to be an educator, but it's really that they administration doesn't want to have to face being having to think about from the person in the classroom's perspective having to think about what's another better way that we can confront some of the issues that we have in our district um, so while we're always being told we need to grow our mindset and you've heard me say this is something that our administration also needs to do if we're going to ex expand on mindsets let's do that together and that requires listening um, and so you've heard over many school board meetings over many years now for those of you who are a regular board member have been on our board for some time many people of not only our unit but also our CSEA brothers and sisters speak to the necessary um, need for change and how people are valued in this district this is another major reason why people leave not only the salary but if I'm going to work as hard as I work as a teacher I can go make better pay, but I know that I'm gonna be valued and I'm gonna be respected. My time is not gonna be so micromanaged. Um, so that that is also important. We look at the mental health of our students, that's so important, but the mental health of our employees is also just as important. Thank you. That we do. We have two public speakers. And so if you could both come up, uh, Radhika Kirkman and Rita Uribe. Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. So as you all know, I am the chief negotiator for PVFT and we are currently in negotiations. And um, I'm probably gonna repeat some things you've already heard, but I'm gonna give you guys some numbers cause that's what my job is mostly dealing with at this current moment. Um, first I wanna talk about our ECE teachers. I was an ECE teacher for uh, close to 12 years before I came into the public education TK-12 world. And that job is incredibly challenging, difficult, and rewarding. Um, it's incredibly important. So right now, our assistant teachers top out on their salary schedule in year six at $17.06 an hour. With the current offer on the table, they would top out at $18.43 an hour. Our associate teachers right now top out at $19.19. So that means if I worked for 40 years, I'm still making $19.19. With the current offer on the table, they would make $20.73. A teacher tops out at $36.93. With the current offer, they would top out at $39.89. The National Low Income Housing Coalition made a report that in order to afford a two bedroom home in Santa Cruz, you would have to make $60.35 an hour. They are nowhere near that. That is poverty wages. Um, and I understand they come from a different funding source. I understand that. We talk about that quite frequently. I'm also gonna give you a little bit of numbers for our adult ed community. They currently top out at 44.57. Offer on the table, they would top out at 48.14. They also get zero paid prep time, even if they work over 35 hours a week. So. I know we contribute to other parts of this district and don't all of our students, teachers, families and community deserve to be lifted up. We can contribute to them as well. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rita Uribe and I'm a first grade teacher at Alianza Charter School. And um, those numbers were pretty dismal and we have the, um, early childhood educators at our school, and I just love seeing the kids there, and I love my students, yeah. Awesome, thank you. And uh, we have 
lost a lot of teachers, 100 teachers this year in the district, and she just gave you the reasons why the numbers. So please, please, please give us a raise so that we can give the children what they need, teachers who can afford to stay here and live here and not have our principals take a teacher job and us lose our prep time. And thank you, Union, for giving us some time back from losing our prep time and equity um, with meetings and whatnot. But we do need to find teachers and attract them, and the way we're going to attract them is through raising our pay scale. So that's it. Thank you. All right. Do we have anyone from uh, CSEA, a California School Employees Association? Nope. All right. How about anybody from PAVAM, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers? Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Angelica Renderia, and I'm the director of the Migrant Season Head Start Program. Welcome, Trustee Flores, to, to PBUSD. I'm happy to be here representing PAPAM with a, a couple of program updates. We continue our collaboration with Cabrillo College, offering early childhood education courses with two goals in mind. One, to attract qualified applicants for the positions in the district, and the second one, to empower parents. Our collaboration with Cabrillo has been titled El Caminito, The Little Pathway. Students participating in El Caminito include parents, family child care home providers, providers assistants, and substitutes. We cover tuition, student fees, the cost of textbooks, and tutorial assistance through a special Head Start grant that is specifically designed for professional development. Last semester, we had a total of 17 participants that completed coursework and acquired between three and six units. This semester, we have 27 participants. About 40% of the students are program parents. This is a wonderful co collaboration for us as it allows us to uh, provide uh, the professional opportunities uh, to the families that request the support as well as parenting skills. In another note, this month we have been extremely busy. The National Migrant Season Hester Association applied for the Farm Worker Relief Grant, and we were able to secure funds to benefit all of the migrant and season Hester families, more than 500. So far, we have distributed a total of 326 $600 cash cards to families. And we would continue appointments in the rest of this week, a few days in March and a few days in April. The goal is to provide all enrolled families with one, two, or three cash cards, depending on elig eligibility. I'm also happy to report that I was able to secure additional one-time funding to complete facilities repairs at four uh, separate uh, program sites, Calabasas, Hall District, H.A. Hyde, and Ohlone, in addition to the um, renovation project that is uh, taking place at Freedom, where we're gonna be able to serve additional infants and toddlers soon. In the areas of family engagement and school readiness, uh, we continue implementing the off-season instructional program with all four-year-olds that are scheduled to attend kindergarten in August. This program allows us to maintain children and families engaged when the centers are closed. Each child gets an iPad and through the use of technology, books, and educational materials purchased by the program, we support their individualized goals through the winter. Families are able to attend monthly meetings where study teams are presented. Parents ask questions and at the end of each month, they submit their students' work and family educational calendars that they complete with their children where they record progress. In addition to the funding for the facilities, I have also uh, been able to secure additional funding, one-time funding, to acquire curriculum materials, supplies, and classrooms to continue the implementation of the curriculum plan. We continue with this program, and it has been very successful. 
Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have anyone from the Communication Workers of America? Not today. All right. Um, so we moved item 9.1 to here. So the California State Seal of Civic Engagement in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District, presented by Peggy Pugh. Good evening, Board President Holm, Board, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I am Peggy Pugh, the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning for PVUSD, and I'm here to present with some colleagues here uh, the State Seal of Civic Engagement and our implementation. Um, I would like to thank and ask anyone who participated in our um, group if you would please stand to be recognized for your service to our task force. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. From the beginning, this work has truly been centered in equity and our student interns who are here with me this evening um, really led us on that path and kept us straight in our efforts towards um, implementation. All righty. So this is a project that came about through the California State Le Legislature. It was approved in 2017 through Assembly Bill 24. And it is intended to be um, a way to further engage high school age students in their, in their communities and to provide them with some um, access to um, civic engagement in high school and projects for that. The state seal is literally a seal. And in order to earn that seal, um, students engage in a, a, a variety of projects. The seal um, will be awarded to students on their diplomas and or on, on their transcripts as well. And it is intended by the legislature and the California Department of Education for each school district to form their own committees and task force to decide how will it, what will it look like um, in that district. For our district, it was important to us that this was truly an inclusive, and this was these were really the, the words of our student interns who served on our uh, city of Watsonville Summer in the City internship program. They really valued the idea that any student who had completed the graduation um, path for them, that they would be able to earn this seal. So you'll see that evident as we um, make our way through our report. Um, one of the important aspects of the, the way that our district and our task force um, went is we really wanted to make sure it didn't become a fully extra thing, but the students could see cross sections that overlapped with other things that they were already doing and then further affirm the work that they were doing. We didn't want it to become overly burdensome while also giving them some experiences that would really push them. So about a year ago, it started with some research and some uh, a group of people getting together and talking about what types of things would be necessary. Um, from there, it went to our superintendent's cabinet. Could we move along in this process? And our, our cabinet said, yes, please do. Our students need and deserve this. And so we began the work by getting our student interns over the summer, um, getting their recommendations. And um, I have three of those students here with us tonight, and you'll hear from them in just a moment. So the work um, started with the students over the summer, and then our core team met, and then we had task force meetings over the course of this fall. And then here we are right now in the winter of 2023. And coming this spring, we'll be identifying and implementing our infrastructure. These are all of the people who participated in our task force. So you'll see here that it is a cross section of students, teachers, a member of our board of trustees, thank you, President Holm, uh, our site and school district leaderships, partners with our city of Watsonville and counselors. Here is our, uh, a photo of our summer in the city interns working with Superintendent Rodriguez as they were um, mulling over lots of different things to talk about, but this is just one of the things they did as interns because one of the things they did with us as interns over the summer was help us to, to narrow down our criteria 
that truly would center students' needs. And they are here to tell you a little bit about their experience. Hello. Um, so I just wanted to say that this was one of the most fruitful opportunities that I was really glad to be able to take part in um, and getting to continue that work from the summer and also like just being in a professional work environment while I got to learn. And really it was meaningful because I knew that it was going to help students be more engaged in our um, community. And so I said, I gained new insights into what it means to be civically engaged. I learned so much about this, the importance of community involvement. And overall, I'm excited for this opportunity that students will have in motivating them to pursue meaningful projects. Hi, my name is Paula, and I was just very thankful that I got the opportunity to work with so many wonderful people. And what I wrote was that I really enjoyed getting to work with others who are enthusiastic about promoting youth involvement in their community. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share my experience and grow in a group setting. Hello, hello I'm Marco Padilla. And this program really helped me because it, I was able to have voice, for, not just for myself, but for peers. And it helped. It, I was able to make students be able to It allowed me to make students be able to learn how to express themselves in the community and how to be civically engaged. <laughs> yeah. Give them a round of applause. These are some of our Summer in the City interns and they were truly uh, amazing to work with. So our task force met over the course of three different uh, evenings. We reviewed resources, we reviewed the recommendations of our students, again, really centering uh, our student interns' voices and uh, making sure this was an inclusive process that centered on equity. Uh, we held discussions and eventually we got to the point where we came up with our criteria. So our criteria are there for you on the slide. The first was very important to our students that the student should be on track to graduate based on each student's unique graduation plan. Unlike some other aspects of, of um, scholarship and awards, uh, this is truly intended to keep the student um, at the center regardless of what their graduation path is. Criteria two, students must complete grade level history and social science courses. Criteria three, students will engage in student civic action projects into accountability and skill level. So again, really building into this, um, our student voice around being an inclusive seal that any student um, who could meet those criteria could earn. Criteria four, students will demonstrate this criteria in a variety of pathways, such as informal presentation, written reflections, multimedia, so giving lots of opportunities for different types of projects. And five, in combination with the evidence of successful completion of three and four, students will provide a form and we'll, we'll have an a application that they'll need to complete. And those are the criteria that we collaboratively together came up with. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. All right. Do we have any discussion from the board? Trustee DeSerpa? This is wonderful. Um, I, we've been involved heavily with the seal of biliteracy, which is such a beautiful thing to have on your transcript and mm -hmm. I love going to those ceremonies and I'm guessing will there be a ceremony at the end of the school year that is similar to yeah. the seal of exactly the, f the following year um, so we're right now in the process of the of implementing this um, our summer interns who worked with us on this process as long as they can get through a couple of these criteria they will be our first awardees and then it'll have the uh, students starting uh, in next school year will have a, their whole school year to, to do it. I'd like yeah. to commend the students who participated voluntarily to make this um, a reality and also to um, Dr. Holm for uh, volunteering her time as well. Uh, thanks to all the staff who was involved in this. This is wonderful. 
And I just, I just wanted to add, you know, that I was so proud to you know, be involved in the, the, the task force and, you know, particularly appreciated the student perspectives, like hearing from you all in those meetings and just having that student voice, you know, centered and hearing your perspectives and, and just seeing how engaged you all were in that process and that you, you know, that you were so, that you contributed so much to those discussions and, and that you were, you, you jumped in and you were active and engaged. And I was like, yes, this is what, this is, this is wonderful. And um, I really see this endeavor as a way for, um, to support students being agents um, for positive change within our communities and having the opportunity to partner with fresh perspectives in, with structured mentorship, like <coughs> bringing those things together under the umbrella of civic engagement. And that was one of my top three reasons for being in this role in the first place. So to me, this is just, this is the good stuff. <laughs> like this, this is what makes all of the sometimes challenging aspects of this role worth it. So thank you for providing an opportunity to enjoy. But it's like, it's, it's wonderful. And I, I really look forward to seeing how this grows and develops and bravo. Anyone else? Okay, All thank right. you very much. Thank you. All right, so going back to our action items. Um, item 8.1, our letter of agreement with Cabrillo Community College District and Pajaro Valley Unified School District running start to college program spring 2023. Report will be presented by Kristen McLean, our coordinator of counseling programs. Good evening, President Dr. Jennifer Holm, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. My name is Chrissy McLean. I'm the coordinator of counseling programs. This evening, I'm here just um, asking for approval of this letter of agreement between Cabrillo and PVUSD. This agreement is just outlining the roles and responsibilities of an existing program that has been going on for multiple years, uh, the Running Start program. It enables early registration at Cabrillo for our senior students. Cabrillo staff come into our high schools with the assistance of the academic counselors on campus and they are guided through um, with support and step-by-step -step instructions to have early registration to Cabrillo. This is what is the benefit of this is students that are signed up for Running Start, they get their first choice of classes before the rest of the community so it's really our, uh, a first push and sell to really get students to access that, those uh, post-secondary successes. And we, it's a far reach for m many, many students to come and sign up for Cabrillo. Again, some, many students who may or have not been accepted to university yet are still encouraged to apply. We know that uh, Cabrillo is a, uh, a pathway that many students are successful in reaching their four-year goals and beyond. So this uh, particular agreement just outlines some roles and responsibilities of each of the parties in Cabrillo and PBUSD and excited to keep our running start and keeping, keep um, continuing to enroll our students and build that partnership with Cabrillo. So I do ask for approval of this agreement. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Dr. I'll make a motion to approve. A yep. second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, 501. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 8.2, approved job descriptions and management schedule. Uh, assistant Director, Expanded Learning, Program Director, Expanded Learning, and Principal Special Education Preschool. The report will be uh, presented by Allison Yazawa, our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Yes, thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So before you tonight, I have two new job descriptions um, for the Extended Learning Program. That is the Assistant Director of Expanded Learning and then the Program Directors of Expanded Learning. So as we had at our last board meeting, we introduced the new positions of the expanded learning opportunity specialists, which are gonna be at every single school site to basically run the day-to-day -day operations of um, the after-school programs and before-school programs. These are now gonna be the administrative positions that are gonna oversee those such positions. Um, 
So we're going to be transitioning to where these administrators, the program directors, will be overseeing multiple school sites. And then with the addition of the assistant director, they will be working at the district office to help oversee the program because now we have expanded to the expanded learning opportunities funding on top of the 21st century and ACES. So we have the two job descriptions outlining that. Um, they'll also be supporting the additional programming that we have to offer through the expanded learning opportunities, which is the additional days and the nine hour day, which is why we're shifting the position. So there'll be 222 days, which is in alignment with being able to cover summer, winter session, and then the regular day program during the school year. Um, the salary schedule then also shows where they are. Um, they're in yellow right there. So they're in alignment with our other coordinators and district level positions of similar duties. So that's those positions. And then the principal special education preschool, um, that is also known as Duncan Element or D Duncan Preschool. Um, in order to recruit uh, and retain a principal for that position, we're putting that position in alignment with our alternative ed principalships. Um, just for a little bit of brief history, the position or that school was actually under the direction of the department, which would be the director of special education. Um, that program, as we know, serves a lot of students and has grown over the years. Therefore, it now is more of a principle in alignment with like our alternative programs, which is why we're moving it up to a higher range. So that's on there as well. So I respectfully request that you approve the job descriptions and salary schedule. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do. We have one, Chris Webb. So, oh, well, so I do recall uh, at the last meeting saying we would get uh, all these other all these positions at every site, and uh, the thing that like kind of strikes me about it is I recall a few years back when Renaissance lost its after school program, the rationale was basically cost cutting, and the district didn't want to pay teachers, of the regular teachers of Renaissance for taking on extra classes after work uh, or after their regular work day, but still during their contractual work day and it seems to me that it would actually be cheaper to have those we had like two teachers getting paid with an extra work agreement twice a week um, it would be cheaper it seems like if we had maintained that rather than adding so many positions plus the management um, and it seems to me that like there's a certain cultural uh, reluctance to honor teachers it, with, for their loss of prep time. I've noticed that this year. Um, as people pointed out, like that's a, that's a regular thing with adult ed. They just don't get prep time at all. So um, I was thinking about this last night when I, when I heard the State of the Union um, and Biden had mentioned the words of his father about a job being about more than a paycheck and it being about dignity and respect. And I would urge the district to reflect on that and ask themselves how they are dignifying and respecting their employees and how they can do so to a greater, greater degree. And let's make sure that when we're, you know, if we're going to say we don't have money for other things, I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense to be like, hey, let's add all these positions, especially when we have existing positions going unfilled. And all too often, we have this um, ignominious issue where you, you guys say, well, wind up raising the wages of some some positions just to meet with minimum wage. And I feel like as a public agency, we should be a higher standard. Like we never, we should be past the law, doing better every time, and not waiting for the law. So thank you. Is there any discussion from the board? I have a qu couple of questions. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so for the assistant director position, mm -hmm. what, what would be the credentials of somebody who would move into a position like that or earn that position? Similar to all of our management positions, which is an admin credential and teaching experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. For both of those positions? Because one's a principal, right? The principal, yes. So that's teaching experience and an admin credential. The program directors, again, teaching experience and an admin credential. And the assistant director would be teaching experience and an admin credential. Okay. And um, in this backup that you provided, what's mm -hmm. the dollar amount that will be, and where's that money coming out of? Is okay. it a, coming out of expanded learning? Yeah, so there, these positions are funded out of expanded learning, mm -hmm. and it's actually not an addition to management positions. It's actually a reduction, as I think I put in the item. We yeah. currently have 10.5 FTE. 
when we when we redid these positions last time a few years ago before COVID, where we split them into each covering two school sites, we, we reduced them at that point because they were at every single school site. And this is an even further reduction. And again, it's out of expanded learning money, so it's not necessarily a, a savings to the general fund, but it is a reduction. It'll be about seven positions. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion to approve. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those. I, oh. I'm sorry, I just had one quick question. Just to confirm, so it's a total of three new positions, correct? There are, technically, they're all new because we're going to fall under a different job description, but if you're looking at management position to management position, mm -hmm. we're reducing them overall, if that's what you're asking. But me. it is three. It's an assistant director, a program director, and a principal, correct? So it's technically one assistant director and it'll be five program directors okay and then the principal is just it's already it, it's already established it's just moving it up on the salary schedule okay so it's not new okay thank you for the mm -hmm. clarification sorry we have a first and a second all those in favor aye, aye. any opposed motion carries five zero one Item 8.3, Rubric Backup Solution. Uh, report will be presented by Dan Weiser, our Director of Tech. Uh, okay, Dan, you've changed. You look a lot like Clint. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, yes, unfortunately, I have to disappoint you and take over for Dan. He actually had a family emergency, so um, best wishes to him, but I told him I would be happy to do his item. That is, of course, until I read that he put the words immutable and air-gapped in his explanation. So I just briefly want to talk about what this is. It's a backup solution that really helps prevent us from um, falling victim to things like ransomware. What it does is it backs up our internal files and what it does is with air gap, meaning that there's actually no way to access that data from the outside. It's actually completely sealed off. And then immutable means even if it were to be accessed, there's no actual way to edit or lock down that data. So even if it were to be accessed by hackers, they wouldn't be able to lock it down and then ransom it off to us. Our current system actually we've had for quite some time used to be one server here and one at the COE. We have since moved it from the COE as they stopped supporting it. So we've actually had two servers here on our current system. It's really not ideal. This new system will allow us to not only have hardware on site, but also have it stored in the cloud, which will give us more backup and ensure that if anything were to happen physically, to our backups, we always have a backup to the cloud. Nice thing is Dan actually spent a lot of time working with other districts, looking into what they used, what's the best kind of uh, product for school districts. What we ended up finding out is Rubric, uh, one that hands down, a lot of districts ended up using it. The nice thing is after looking at the three-year savings or three-year costs versus what we're currently using, it actually ends up being a savings to the district. So overall, we do see a $3,000 uh, savings over three years, $4,000. But um, we do have a little bit of startup cuts, that, but that'll come out of Dan's Measure L funds that he still has for technology. So again, this is really to prevent the district from ever being victim to ransomware and being able to back up our files um, at a moment's notice. Some of these files, just for your information, would be a lot of our critical student data, any of our files that are held in m and uh, technology, transportation, finance, payroll. Um, not any of our payroll system, because that's on its own actual server, but we also have our, all of our phone connections are through there. We also have our, um, our web management and some of our um, data management on that as well. So quite a bit of things that actually will be backed up through this, but again, overall a savings to the district. So I'd ask the board uh, respectfully approve this item. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. All right, any discussion from the board? All right. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve this um, just with the comment that this is imperative that we protect um, especially, especially the privacy and the um, information of our students. So yeah. with that, I'm making that motion. Great. Yeah, I'll second. And uh, just to add a comment, at my office in the city of Santa Cruz, we were affected by ransomware and it affected mm -hmm. our whole payroll system, not only us, but several other agencies that use the same uh, Kronos program for for time cards and payroll, so we had to do everything manual for a couple of weeks until they finally got it straightened out. So yeah, it's, it, it makes a big difference. It does. All right, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Motion carries 501. Thank you so much. All right. Moving on to item 8.4, approve notice of completion and change order number one for Pajaro Valley High School Learning <coughs> Hub Project 2022007. Lindo. Director of Maintenance Operations and Facilities. Good evening, President Holmes, um, Dr. Rodriguez, board members, cabinet. My name is Arlindo Fernandez and I'm here to ask for the approval of the NOC with one change order for the learning hub at Pajaro Valley High School. The change order came in at $7,382. Um, that was for the addition of she additional sheetrock and doors that were added in a window for the storefront. It was originally supposed to be glass in there, but it came in over budget, so we had to do something different. So I'm asking for the approval for the NOC and with this change order that came in at 4.39%. And you can see in the pictures here of the completion, there's this two windows, the two large windows and the door separating the two rooms. There's That's it right there, that's at PB High Library Learning Hub. <coughs> so uh, I'm asking for the approval of this NOC. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? So, uh, Dr. Rodriguez? Can you tell us more about this project and what yeah. it means for the students there? Yeah, for sure. So as we were going into in-person learning, so you might remember back all the way back to 2021, um, we made certain modifications or certain things that we, we put in place using in-person learning one-time funding. So one of them was the outside shade structure. So each school received an outside shade structure that could be used for outdoor learning. The other was um, from the surveys that we have from parents, they spoke to at the high school level wanting to have locations in which students could receive tutoring. And so what we did is part of that was creating a learning hub in which UCSC and Access tutors, um, so those are our college level tutors, could provide tutoring to our students. And so each high school, um, including our um, alternative ed, so Renaissance and New School as well, um, received funding in which they could um, work with um, IMNO and um, work through a bid process in order to be able to identify learning hubs that they felt was um, supportive. So this is actually, um, it looks, um, well, it's, it's really expensive. It actually is building off of what they saw at Aptos High. So Aptos High within their library has these um, small rooms in which students can collaborate in and also they can receive um, targeted instruction in and targeted um, tutoring. So they were mirroring it off of um, what they saw at Aptos High. And so you would think creating these small um, learning spaces in these small rooms um, would not be expensive, but it actually um, was, was pretty expensive, but I think it's going to be a really great asset, um, especially um, if you're part of AVID, they do a lot of um, tutoring that, and then all of our access staff is also providing tutoring in this space. Um, and so PV High um, is one of the last to come in um, with their learning hubs um, because most of the other were done last year. Um, but we're glad that they finally have this space um, where students can receive supports. So um, I'm guessing in this space they're like Wi-Fi, they, they have whiteboards, or yep. right? Because mm -hmm. this is just kind of the rough. 
And yes. there's some color going in there and furniture. And yeah, for, yeah, that, this is just, um, this is the, what we're doing right here is the final change order. And, um, and so this is prior to having students actually in there. But yes, there will be furniture in there and um, there will also be um, decorations going up. Um, but it is, um, it is really wonderful if you've ever wanted to do work with a small group. Um, it's really a pretty cool area to be able to have, and all of our facilities have Wi-Fi. So it's within our buildings. That's great. I'll make a motion to approve. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'll second that. I just had a clarifying question, because you said initially this was coming now that it was one-time funding. So where's the additional coming from now? So anytime that we do a project, we always do the contingency. So this is under the 10%. So we're okay. fine. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. So I have a second. Um, trustee to surface motion. All right. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion. 501. All right. Moving on to 8.5, election of a representative to the CSBA Delegate Assembly. Report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, our superintendent. Yeah, thank you so much. So as we noted previously, um, there are regional representatives for CSBA. So this is our opportunity to um, fill that vacancy. And so we have the opportunity to select one candidate. Um, there are two people noted on board docs. So it's Mark Becker and Phil Rodriguez. Um, the board has the opportunity to select which one that they would like to vote for. And um, then we would send in that vote um, for, and it would be combined with the votes of other board of trustees to determine who would take that spot, whether it would be Mark Becker or it would be Phil Rodriguez. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Do we have any discussion from the board? I, I have one can, question. Oh, I was, I'm sorry. I was going to say, yeah, can he, um, we see the Phil Rodriguez one, please? And real quick, a question about, so is it one vote as our board? Okay. Yeah, so there would need to be a motion a second, mm -hmm. and then you would vote. If that vote failed, then you would go to the next person, or there could be a decision not to vote for either. Can, is that, yeah. Who are we looking at there? Is that Phil or Mark? Phil. Phil. It's Phil. Yeah. My understanding is that Phil Rodriguez is the current delegate. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure if he's the current delegate. He he's on the SoCal board. I think Deb Tracy was a delegate at one time. I don't. I can't remember who the current delegate is. You know, I think both candidates are excellent. Phil's seat is closer to us geographically. Um, and I think he's a great guy. I don't know Mark personally, but his, he's got a, a nice set of credentials as well. He's the board president, I think, of SLV. <coughs> I'll make a motion to support Phil's candidacy. I'll second that. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 501. That's great. All right, moving on to item 9.2, um, 
update on provisional appointment for PVSD Board of Trustees Area 6. I will be giving that presentation. Uh, if we can bring up the PowerPoint. Can I get the clicker? All right. So we, um, the notice and the link to the application, it went out um, in Sp English and Spanish, and it was posted by midday the Thursday after our previous board meeting. So it went out on, ja on January 26th on the PVUSD website, and it was also included in the news section of every PVUSD school website. Um, the application was shared on social media and it was shared um, in the Register Pajaronian, the Sentinel, and the Lookout. Um, all applications had to be on file in the district office, um, by the superintendent's office, no later than Monday, this past Monday by 5 p.m. and either by hard copy or uh, by email to Eva Renteria and Let's see, we did have an informational session um, on January 31st at 6 p.m. with Dr. Rodriguez in the PVSD board meeting, and we did have one applicant who attended. The application committee met uh, this past Monday, and we reviewed the applications for eligibility. Of the four applications reviewed, all four were determined to be eligible. I will note that there was an error on uh, Mr. Rivas's form. He, d he adjusted that, and a corrected version was uploaded to Board Docs. So just making note of that. So this coming Saturday, we're going to have our special board meeting to you know, determine if we can you know, do a special appointment. So we're gonna, uh, the, spe the candidates will be asked to arrive at 945. The order of the interviews will be chosen randomly. Um, the candidates will remain in a separate room so that they won't hear what the questions are and you know, they won't hear the responses. Um, each candidate will be asked the same six questions and each have two minutes for the response. Each candidate will, may offer a two minute closing statement if they wish. In addition, the board can consider um, candidates' responses from the application you know, when, they're, when we're making our choices. And at the discretion of the board, additional questions may be asked of the final candidates, and I'll, this, I'll talk about that in a moment. So what we're going to do is that each, you know, uh, each board member will have a question that they ask, you know, ask the applicants. Um, so it's, we're going to basically, Dr. Rodriguez has um, six questions that she's run by our legal counsel. And as part of conducting a fair and equitable process, it's important that each applicant be judged by the same measures. So, you know, in the initial round of those interview questions, we won't be asking questions beyond those six. So we'll just hand each of us a question, and that will be the question that we ask each candidate. We are going to allow two forms of public comments. There will be um, in-person comments and written comments. Those who wish to address the board during public comment may do so by completing a speaker card in person in the district office before the beginning of the agenda item. Um, as is our policy, each person may have two minutes um, for, you know, for their comment. We are going to offer members of the public an opportunity to submit written comments, you know, via a Google form. Um, while these, we aren't going to read those comments aloud during the meeting, however, we are going to make those comments, you know, available via board docs. Um, and they will be available, you know, to members of the public and the board. And we will have a short recess, um, you know, during the meeting for any last minute comments that happened, you know, like right at, you know, before the close of the, that Google document, like at nine o'clock before the meeting starts. So the link will be posted 24 hours prior to the start of the meeting, and it will close at 9 a.m. prior to the start of the meeting. So 
So once we've gone through that process, the board will discuss, basically we'll discuss our options. A way to manage this, and this is, you know, we can, a way to manage this is to hold nominations until board members have had a chance to each make comments, right? If it looks like there may not be consensus, you know, around a candidate, then the board may determine, you know, follow-up questions that we would like to ask who, you know, like the final candidates might be. This is a little bit more streamlined than potentially going through multiple nominations, votes, rescissions of those votes, and then revisions. If there is a nomination that gains the support of the majority of the board, and that's four votes, then that candidate becomes the provisionally uh, appointed a trust trustee for area six. If we do not, you know, achieve a majority, so if we have like a tie vote or just can't achieve a majority, then the board will have failed to make an appointment. And then uh, Dr. Ferris Sabah, the county superintendent, will order an election uh, that will be conducted in November. And the board, the seat will remain empty until November. But if all goes well, then when we have a provisional appointee, they will be sworn in at the next regular board meeting on February 22nd. And that's it. All right. Any public comments to this item? We have none. Any board discussion? All right. So. I, you know, I will say one thing. I, I want to just um, show some gratitude for the four people that have stepped forward as candidates. It takes courage to do that. And yeah. Um, it's not an easy job, and so I want to thank all four candidates for putting their name in the ring and um, doing their applications. All right, well, with that, I will move on to item 10, our consent agenda. And these items are routine items coming before the board, and do we have any public speakers to the consent agenda? We do not. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as is. All right. Uh, can I have a second? Anyone? I'll second. All right. Uh, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries uh, 501. Um, Moving on, we don't have any deferred consent agenda items. Uh, item 13.1, report on closed session items. And we do have a report out of closed session. Um, I'm sorry, under two, item 2.1. So um, under closed session agenda item 2.1, the board with a 5-0 vote approved the district administration recommendation of a full expulsion for one year for student number 22-23-004. Under closed session agenda item 2.1, the board moved, um, the board with a 5-0 vote approved the district administration recommendation of a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the year for student number 22-23-003. And, yes, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm reading this, having to think for a second, excuse me. Um, so under closed session item number 2.2, um, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district admi administration on February 8th 2023 with a six with six and six additional action items I'll second all those in favor aye, aye. any opposed motion carries 501 on closed session item 2.3 I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on February 8th 2023 with 27 and 10 additional action items I'll second all, the, uh, all those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 501. Okay, and we have a couple of announcements. Um, so announce uh, the Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Aaron Lagorieta. Legoretta. Okay, so I was going to bomb one at least tonight. Sorry about that, Aaron. As the new principal of H.A. Hyde Elementary School, and Aaron is a graduate of Watsonville High School, and we are excited to have a PBUSD graduate move into a site leadership role. Aaron has been working with students since 2007 as a teacher at Ohlone Elementary and Redcliffe Elementary. For the last four years, she has been the academic coordinator at MSD Elementary. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Liberal Studies and a multiple subject teaching credential from San Francisco State University. She obtained her administrative credential through the Santa Clara County Office of Education. We are proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to her new administrator role. Go Hornets. And is Erin here? Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, congratulations, Erin. Um, our second announcement for this evening, uh, the Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Salo Torado as the new supervisor of maintenance and operations. Salo has been working for PBUSD since 2015 as both a bus driver and maintenance specialist carpenter. Salo has a wide range of experience in his career, including carpentry, construction, reading blueprints, managing job sites, and taking on difficult projects. Additionally, his knowledge about the schools, sites, and processes in PBUSD will allow him to have a smooth transition into his new role. We are proud to welcome Salo to, into his new administrative position. And is Salo by chance here? He's not. Well, congratulations again. All right. So our next meeting will be a special board meeting on February 11th, 2023 at 10 a.m. for the provisional appointment for a trustee area six. And the next regular board meeting will be on February 22nd, uh, 2023. And with that, the meeting is adjourned at 8.43 p.m.